Hey, good evening and welcome again um, for this last panel on a fascinating question, the lawmaking and human rights mechanisms. Uh, obviously, if you are traditional international law professors, uh, members of the International Law Commission, and many uh, legal advisors of government, the answer is simply no. There is no lawmaking by the human rights mechanism. Obviously. Did you hear me? No. Shall I start again? So, because that's the message he doesn't like. But I'm uh, one of these, on the one hand and on the other hand, lawyers. And I come to the other hand. Uh, and indeed, um, OK. Obviously, the Human Rights Council has prepared very few uh, international treaties, which were then adopted by states and finally uh, ratified by states. Uh, it is true that uh, some pronouncements in the Human Rights Council, uh, according to the methodology which the International Law Commission has recently reaffirmed, could lead to customary law, but would normally not, because states know that decisions and any production by the Human Rights Council is not legally binding. The jurisprudence of human rights bodies, our states often underline, is also not legally binding and will therefore not create a precedent. Now, I think that this is simply wrong from an obs point of view of the observation of state practice, even if we forget non-state actors, academia, and so on, because states apparently care of what happens in human rights bodies. Uh, most of you have already suffered from long <laughs> meetings where every comma is negotiated. So apparently, those diplomats who negotiate those commas don't believe their legal advisors in the capital who claim, at least at conferences where I participate, that all this is non law, is uh, just uh, um, policy. And I think in a decentralized legal order, such as international law, without an ordering court, uh, without a parliament, uh, the differences between lawmaking, interpretation, and application are much more relative than in domestic law. And this is in particular true for human rights and human rights instruments which are living uh, instruments. Similarly, in my view, the difference between binding and non-binding is much more relative in a legal order, rarely judicially enforced uh, at the international level. And even in domestic courts, on the, on the one hand, in my view, rightly so, they take increasingly into account non-binding pronouncements, including by human rights uh, treaty bodies. Uh, you have seen that recently uh, French appeal court has considered that someone should not be left to die because a uh, human rights treaty body considered for reasons we will not discuss today, um, that this is a violation of the rights of persons with disabilities. So it has an impact. And on the other hand, domestic courts have developed avoidance strategies to avoid even hard treaty norms. You know them, non-self-executing, act of state, political question doctrine. Uh, and anyway, in half of the domestic legal systems of the world, a super hard treaty norm must first be incorporated into the domestic law and is otherwise simply irrelevant for the um, 
traditionalist lawyers. I think that reality is more differentiated and uh, we have to take into account both the non-binding normative propositions as also the practice of human rights mechanisms if we want to understand what influences international reality and in my view this is what international law is about. Obviously, if you want to distinguish law and policy strictly, you simply put into policy what you don't like. Um, so uh, the sociological analysis of the degree of influence is often quite independent of the traditional categories we teach in our courses on the theory of sources, and this is why this panel uh, is meaningful and important, because be conscious that for Sir Michael Wood, it's nonsense, this panel, because they cannot make law. <laughs> this is where he was the special rapporteur on customary law of the International Law Commission. So we think uh, perhaps we can find interesting things here, but I will leave that to Sarah Cleveland, who is much better qualified. But first, Camilla Kimileva will uh, make uh, some more human rights specific remarks and bring us down to the earth of the reality of human rights mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, Marco, I can never fly as high as you fly, so I will bring you down to the, to the earth, that's true. Um, the panelists, the panel is a little bit unusual um, for, for, for this kind of conferences, and uh, I'm very grateful um, for, 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 for the panelists to play the game. Um, we will not have presentations, we have composed two pages of very different questions, uh, which came partially from the panel, partially from the reality of the human rights mechanisms today. Um, and um, now, Sarah is great, um, and all the panelists, Michael, Alexandra, Ambassador White, Andrew, are great, but I think that we will all be sort of equally unhappy at the end because we, didn't, we will not be able to come to any um, conclusion of how human rights mechanisms co-work together. We will not be able to reply to all the questions. However, I hope we will give in one hour and a half or a little bit less some, um, some probably ways or, or pistes or, or paths to, to follow um, about, I would say, probably what is very much needed, a little bit more cross-referencing, uh, a little bit more taken into consideration uh, by all the human rights mechanisms, what other human rights mechanisms are doing. So this will be the, the sole challenge of, of, of this panel today. As I said, no formal presentation, so uh, directly uh, kicking the, the debate. Um, you have the uh, short biographies of all the panelists in your folders, so I will not read this out, although they deserve it. And I will get directly probably to, to Sarah, who is the, the big uh, conceiver and, uh, and, uh, and manager and moderator and substantive, uh, actually, uh, inspiration of, of this panel. Thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's a large lift to carry for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, welcome everyone to the final panel, uh, which is bringing us in some ways back to the themes uh, that we started with in the morning, looking at the interaction of various human rights treaty mechanisms, specifically with respect to their normative and lawmaking function. Um, and here I would uh, express concurrence uh, in the views of Professor Sassoli, and thank him for his very uh, learned explication of this issue. Um, my own personal view in thinking about the influence and effect of international law and norms is that it actually makes less difference whether something uh, is law or not. 
then it matters what the incentives are for a state or others to comply in any particular context. And legal force can create an incentive to comply, but it may not be an incentive that is sufficient, and there may be sufficient incentives to comply even if something is not hard law. Um, so with that sort of uh, framing, I think the, the, the focus is on law and norm enunciation, and we're not going to think too hard about uh, fine line drawing here, although I will recognize that the European Court of Human Rights makes law, in fact. Um, so we have a fantastic panel here today to discuss these issues, and we are going to try to discuss them in the round, which is to say that I'm going to ask extremely large questions to the panelists, and they're expected to provide extremely brief and concise answers. Um, and I wanted to start out uh, with Andrew Clapham, professor here uh, in Geneva, um, but for our purposes, particularly importantly, a member of the UN Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan. Uh, this is, of course, a Human Rights Council mechanism. Uh, and I would just uh, welcome your thoughts on what role the work of other aspects of the UN uh, human rights system, whether rapporteurs or the UPR or the treaty bodies, has or doesn't have, or influence it has or doesn't have relevance uh, to your work on the commission. Um, thank you, Sarah. Well, the theme of today is connectivity, and I wanted to sort of start off by maybe giving some examples of where I think there should not be connectivity amongst the bodies, just to be a little contrarian. But also, coming from a commission of inquiry, um, my experience over the last couple of years is often states and NGOs and the press saying, you know, we hope you're cooperating with this body or that body, and we imagine you're sharing with this and that, and it's all about we're all in this together, and it's the UN. But um, maybe I'll just give four examples of where um, we don't share information. The first would be where we have a witness statement or some information, and if we were to share it, it would be to put someone at risk. Now, of course, that can arise in the treaty bodies and in other contexts, but in a commission of inquiry where you've been asked to develop uh, the case for a war crimes prosecution and there's an ongoing conflict, the risks are, are very real, and so we would never share information if we thought we were putting one of the people we'd spoken to at risk. The second is where, and maybe this is not so well known, um, a lot of people speak to us with certain conditions. So a woman giving testimony about a particular incident in her village may say, well, you can use my um, information, but only if it's going to result in the prosecution of someone at the hybrid court for South Sudan. I don't want it being used for UPR or for, I mean, they don't say that, but uh, for some uh, other mechanism such as a truth commission or some truth-telling process or for national prosecution or for NGO material and so on. So the, the conditions under which you get the information even if there's no risk to that person, they feel quite strongly that they only want this to be used once and it should be for a prosecution. Well aware that if the information comes out and gets contradicted in other contexts, that it somehow becomes less value as currency for a future prosecution. Um, and a third one, which maybe is not, again, obvious, is the Security Council. The Security Council can impose arms embargoes, asset freezes, travel bans on individuals for violations of human rights. And so it's assumed that the Commission of Inquiry that looks into human rights violations would share, obviously, everything with the Security Council. But that could be extremely dangerous because the Security Council, on any topic, I won't go into the politics of South Sudan, could be split. Let's say you have one regional group that wants to go one way, perfectly legitimately on the question of whether somebody should be sanctioned. They think it's unhelpful to the peace process or it's not necessary or the information doesn't stand up. And another block in the Security Council wants to go a second way. If you are perceived in country as working with one or other block within the Security Council and doing their work for them, you're not going to be able to get your message across to the government. You will be an outreach of the pen holder or this block or that block. So actually, it may come as a surprise, we don't share our information um, when the Security Council is looking to sanction um, individuals. Partly also because if our job is to get prosecutions, if that information gets out into the public domain, then you can't have a prosecution because uh, the 
defence will be able to prepare their case knowing exactly what information is there. Other people will come forward to contradict it and the prosecutor will say, I, I can't run this case. It's, it's going to be an unfair trial. So there might be lots of good reasons, actually, in international criminal justice um, and also in the high politics of the Security Council for not sharing information. One has an independent job to do. If the Security Council wants to sanction someone, they can have their own investigators. I've probably taken a bit too long, but I'd like to um, mention something on lawmaking. Um, well, can I add? So I'm going to reiterate yeah. my question, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is, um, I think you've importantly highlighted ways in which, uh, depending on the nature of the mechanism and the nature of the inquiry, confidentiality can be important in various contexts. Um, but are the other... UN mechanisms helpful to you, or are there ways that you can be helpful to them? So for example, the Human Rights Committee in the last year reviewed Sudan and Sudan's human rights record. Is that a context in which you would feel that it was useful to provide information to a treaty body or have a treaty body look at publicly available information that your commission has produced? And would that happen in the system as it currently exists? I think we're in um, unknown territory here. I don't think it's happened so far. On my way walking here, I thought what would be a good example of where a commission of inquiry could help a treaty body um, in a professional way. And the one which came to mind was, imagine there's a complaint to a treaty body and the treaty body is thinking, well, maybe this individual hasn't exhausted domestic remedies. The Commission of Inquiry or the Human Rights Commission sent by the UN working in that country over a period of years will know very well whether there really were domestic remedies to exhaust. And it seems to me it would be a perfect example of the treaty body saying, why don't we ask the Commission of Inquiry um, whether there really are domestic remedies here? And you would have a UN entity capable of giving a proper neutral opinion on that. So I think there would be certainly room for some exciting ideas. I don't see why a treaty body couldn't ask to hear from a commission of inquiry just as they hear from civil society. Um, it wouldn't be that odd for a UN entity to give presentations to a treaty body. I remember when uh, Kosovo was being uh, before the Human Rights Committee and UNMIC was there explaining as a very particular circumstance, but it's not completely unknown that the UN presents before a treaty body. So I, I, if I had more time, I could come up with lots of examples, I think. So I'm not going to give you any, no. <laughs> we will come back to you, but, but just with the example of exhaustion of domestic remedies, that would be a question that would arise in the context of individual communications. Um, that, of course, would require that there be me some mechanism for some entity other than a party to the communication to provide information to a treaty body the Human Rights Committee recently revised its rules of procedure to provide at least in principle for the submission of amicus briefs, uh, which would um, be at least a step in the direction of opening up that otherwise confidential process to this kind of information, which could be useful. Okay, so we're now going to turn to the region. Uh, Michael O'Boyle uh, was deputy registrar of the European Court of Human Rights for how many years? And you were there longer. Oh, yes. 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 So, um, so I guess the, the question for you, Michael, you have a court that is well established with legally binding jurisdiction over 47 member states of the Council of Europe and uh, has established um, a substantial body of jurisprudence and an impressive reputation. And then you have these annoying entities in Geneva uh, like the UN Human Rights Committee and others that think they have the capacity to second guess uh, the inadmissibility or other decisions of, of your court. So how do you feel about this? Um, and I'm asking you this in your personal capacity, not as representative of the European Court of Human Rights. And how should we think about the navigation of the relationship between human rights bodies that have common jurisdiction over particular states to apply potentially, well, very similar, but potentially somewhat different human rights norms? In five words or less. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah, for that rather simple question. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the question of comment, um, had I been 
uh, here ex officio, then obviously my answer would probably be slightly different. But I retired from the court some years ago, and so I have brought with me uh, all the baggage of my experience and none of the sense of obligation that I must be loyal to the court uh, for which I worked. Um, it, uh, my reaction when confronted with instances where there is an obvious contradiction between, on the one hand, a judgment of the court, and on the other hand, a decision or a, a view of uh, one of the treaty bodies, is uh, perhaps you might be surprised, surprisingly liberal, subject to se several conditions. Um, it's liberal in the sense that from where I'm standing, the opportunity for conflict is enormous, given the fact that uh, particularly the C Committee on Human Rights, the treaty bodies are essentially reading from the same hymn sheet, a hymn sheet that is based on uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, there are differences between the treaties, but by and large, as far as the main civil and political rights are concerned, these are essentially the same rights. So I regard it as nothing short of miraculous that um, there is no major conflict between the corpus of law that has been built up in Strasbourg and the corpus of law or the corpus of decisions um, that have been built up uh, in the United Nations. Now, when a conflict occurs, <coughs> um, such as the one that you mentioned this morning, where you have uh, on the, the European Court of Human Rights finding that in the exercise of its margin of appreciation, the French law that banned the burqa was not a violation of uh, the rights of freedom of religion. And on the other hand, a different view had been taken by the commission. Well, um, of, of course, it's surprising. But if one looks at it a second time, you get to understand that the context in which the uh, committee reaches its views is an entirely different one, um, especially in an area as sensitive and uh, uh, as affected by context as religious freedoms. Um, so uh, the universal view of issues relating to freedom of religion and the wearing of, of a burqa, in my view, uh, it doesn't really surprise me uh, with the broader context that your treaty bodies are dealing with that such a view would be expressed. I do have difficulties with forum shopping, on the other hand. And uh, many years ago, I came across a decision of a fellow a lawyer from Portugal um, who was unhappy with the judgment that he got rejecting his case in Strasbourg. And he trotted down the road to Geneva. And uh, he argued his case. And he got a completely different result. Uh, and that struck me as being completely strange because it's the same applicant, exactly the same treaty provision exactly the same defendant state and two different results. And you, you only had and no reference whatsoever uh, by the uh, committee to the Strasbourg decision, none, none whatsoever. <coughs> that, that's not right. Uh, and um, it calls for uh, an interp a different interpretation to that provision in the optional protocol, Article 5, which enables the committee to examine cases uh, where they have already been examined by another international body. If the situation had been the reverse, and he had first got a result here that he wasn't happy with and came to Strasbourg, under our admissibility requirements, uh, he would be prevented, the court would be prevented from looking at it. It seems to me that's an area where something should be uh, you know, there should be some degree of harmonization. Now, even if there was harmonization, that would still not prevent that, that, that contradiction from occurring. But contradictions, where they happen uh, rarely uh, on, a, on a minor basis, are not necessarily bad things. I mean, the Court of Human Rights understands that it's not a closed system. It's part of a dynamic system. 
the law and the manner in which law is interpreted will vary as the years pass. It's dealing with 47 different jurisdictions. Within those jurisdictions, you're going to have similar contradictions. Supreme courts and constitutional courts are going to disagree on some aspect of convention law. And the court's approach to that is that it's to be expected, and that these issues can be worked through by a form of judicial dialogue. And the judicial dialogue is not necessarily, although it does often involve meetings where you sit down with judges from different countries, the judicial dialogue is usually conducted through the decided cases. And there are many instances where, even though, the, say, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom had a different view on a particular provision and how it should be interpreted from that of the court. After discussion and after a different case, the court has rallied to some formula that manages to paper over the differences. So I think the crucial thing here, and this is my last word, uh, <laughs> the crucial thing here is that the dialogue takes place on toute connaissance de cause, that is to say, that both bodies take into account each other's case law. The first case that I mentioned where the committee didn't do that, that, that I think those days are finished. It behoves both the court, notwithstanding its, in inverted commas, hierarchical superiority as a matter of normative, as a matter of norms, but it behoves both the court and the committee to be aware of each other's case law and to give full effect to that where possible. Now, our court, when it's examining a case that goes, for example, to the Grand Chamber, it will have before it amicus curiae briefs, which will set out uh, international comparative law in detail. It will also have before it a document that's prepared by the services of the court's jurist consult, where it sets out <coughs> um, relevant decisions of other international bodies, including the treaty bodies, so that whatever decision it reaches will be done by taking against the background of the law as it is known or as it has been developed by all relevant bodies in the field. No, I, I agree uh, that it's one thing for there to be disagreement in the interpretation of rights by different bodies when that disagreement is well-informed and self-conscious and based on strong reasons. Um, it's another thing for it to happen accidentally because of lack of information. And I would say one, one weak link in the relationship between the hu UN human rights treaty bodies and the regional systems at present is that the treaty bodies don't have an amicus mechanism that is well established um, and also do not have the equivalent uh, professional secretariat or registry that produces internal uh, memoranda surveying comparative uh, international human rights jurisprudence. So that jurisprudence comes to the attention of the treaty bodies in deciding individual cases on a much more ad hoc basis. It either has to be raised by the parties themselves in their submissions or someone in the secretariat knows about it or finds it, or some member of the treaty body knows about it or finds it. And this, of course, uh, yields much more uneven um, uh, awareness of, of comparative <coughs> jur jurisprudence. That said, at least the Human Rights Committee uh, has tried to be very, very attentive to uh, um, the decisions of sister mechanisms in recent years to the extent uh, it is able to do so. When I came on the Human Rights Committee, the Human Rights Committee would not cite non-UN jurisprudence and preferred not to cite anything but itself. Um, and those days are long since over, and I think appropriately so, because um, it is one entity among many. Um, we can come back to the forum shopping issue, hopefully, um, but I do think that the work of registries like yours is extraordinarily important in this process. Can, can I just yes. very quickly say that in the 1960s, if one looks at judgments of the European <laughs> Court of Human Rights, there's no reference whatsoever in the 1970s, the early 1970s. There's no reference whatsoever to any foreign decision, be it a United Nations treaty body or by, by another international court. Um, and basically, 
that was something that was brought about by a former registrar of the court who belonged to the old school of jurisprudence that you only referred to judgments of yourself. And I mean, my interpretation as a young fella coming to this system and rather shocked by such a narrow frame, my interpretation of that was that this was a rule that was adopted, or practice that was adopted, in order to um, ensure that the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights dominated the field. Um, and that, we, that was very quickly um, abandoned. But there is a court today in Europe that maintains that practice, uh, and that's the European Court of Justice, one of the most important courts in Europe that frequently is called upon to interpret issues of human rights. It will not refer to any judgments of... It, it, it used to refer to judgments of our court, but it stopped doing that now because it's too complicated for them. Um, but it's certain, <laughs> it will certainly not refer to the treaty bodies. I doubt if they know the treaty bodies exist, and it certainly won't refer to the Inter-American Court. And... I find this absolutely arrogant and baffling, and I look forward to a time when um, the Court of Justice uh, understands that, in a sense, when it comes to interpreting human rights, we're all part of the same legal system, and it it's e even goes beyond a matter of comity uh, that it has regard to judgments of fellow courts and bodies that are dealing with exactly the same issue. Speaking of connectivity within Europe, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So, um, Alexandra, uh, turning to you uh, from your position as an international law professor um, at the People's Friendship University of Russia, what do you see as the main challenges to uh, securing connectivity among human rights mechanisms in norm enunciating activities? Is it a good thing to try to ensure that these bodies reach the same outcomes when they're addressing similar issues? Or what are your thoughts on this? Thank you very much for this uh, interesting question. Um, yeah, as an academic, uh, I'm uh, coming across these issues uh, quite often. And as I have my classes with the students, they always uh, raise this kind of questions. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to be honest, um, I would say that from a stakeholder perspective, uh, firstly, if we look, about, uh, look at uh, states who are the main duty bearers, um, it would be easier if there was a coherent approach taken by uh, various <coughs> human rights bodies to um, interpretation and application of international human rights norms. Um, although uh, we should understand that different bodies, um, in that sense, well, if we talk about treaty body system, yeah, they're specific in all their spheres. They've been established by a particular treaty to deal with a particular set of issues, and they have developed their own specific expertise and experience in a particular field. And um, uh, I would say that an uh, interpretation by a particular body could be uh, very valuable for a state and in some sense uh, there could be also a um, complementarity uh, between the different uh, treaty bodies um, addressing uh, certain kind of issues. Um, so I would say that um, from a stakeholder's perspective, yes, it's positive. On the other side, we should keep in mind that we should not um, lose certain kind of um, protection given to particular issues by particular bodies. Um, so not to come to a gap in the protection of human rights. If this would be like my uh, one point of view, and maybe yeah, I can uh, raise some other issues afterwards. So if, if you want me to be concise. Uh. <laughs> so just, just picking up on the point you just made, I think, uh, for example, um, the Russian Federation mm -hmm. and the United States um, 
would both, it is my guess, be likely to take the position that they like harmonization with respect to entities where they have ratified the treaty and they don't like harmonization with respect to treaties that they haven't ratified. So certainly the US position would be that um, it has not ratified CEDAW or the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, or the Disabilities Convention or the Disappearance Convention, to name a few. <laughs> 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 and it therefore would not want something like the Human Rights Committee to be interpreting provisions of the ICCPR in light of norms being developed under those other treaties. Nevertheless, there may be sound reasons that those norms are being developed under those other treaties that would also justify the same approach being taken um, in interpreting a treaty that the, uh, the US is a party to. Um, so I, I, your other comments, let me, I'll pitch something to you and you can, you can decide whether to answer it or not. Um, do, you have, do you have views to the extent that harmonization or um, maybe coordination of um, normative uh, developments is beneficial? Do you see ways that the system as currently configured could be improved to better achieve that goal? In terms of um, harmonization? Treaty bodies, human rights council mechanisms, relationship to regional courts. What should we do better? <laughs> That's an, uh, um, um, yeah, quite, of course, an uneasy question. Um, I would say that uh, the first step is uh, better sharing of information between the bodies to know each other's um, interpretations uh, better and uh, maybe finding ways to uh, come to uh, co coherent views uh, on certain issues. Um, so, um, yeah, I would say that this would be a, a first step. Um, the other um, aspect is that we have to take into account the different mandates of different uh, human rights mechanisms that are today existing, uh, be it treaty bodies, uh, human rights council, universal periodic review, regional human rights bodies, international courts, uh, totally uh, different uh, legal nature of their activities. So um, I should be rather thinking that we sh yeah, we need to be quite careful with going uh, deeper into harmonization between these two mechanisms. So, um, yeah, uh, um, although um, I think also that in some sense, uh, well, there could be a, a com complementarity, uh, if we can say also a harmonization of human rights mechanisms. Uh, for instance, some bodies could deal with certain kind of issues that could not be dealt at regional level so then there is a positive aspect in this sense. So, um, yeah, I would say this way. <laughs> Great, thank you. Madam Ambassador, uh, permanent representative for Costa Rica uh, here in Geneva for a number of years. Uh, thank you, Camelia. Um, from the perspective of a political representative of a state that is uh, sympathetic to and supportive of the human rights system, both in the Americas as the seat of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And also here, I, I would just note that Costa Rica has been a consistent supporter of conversations regarding treaty body strengthening, among others, and thank your government for that. Uh, what do you see as the challenges uh, with respect to uh, the, vari the relationship among the various mechanisms uh, that we are discussing, um, and how would you like to see them addressed to the extent you feel uh, in a position to comment? Let me start by a general um, comment or reflection on what I heard, because one would um, expect and aspire to be in a position or in the process of building intrasystem connectivity 
coherence and complementarity. The words are similar, but not necessarily the same. So we would expect that there is enough flow of information and communication between the treaty bodies and the intergovernmental bodies and mechanisms and the independent mechanisms and instruments that the, that the intergovernmental bodies create, uh, right? And let me go to very specific examples um, before addressing the regional universal uh, complementarity and connectivity. Um, we just went through our UPR system. It has been very interesting for me to be able to go through three or four treaty body examinations of my country here in, in Geneva, but also the UPR. And um, we do a lot of UPR um, case studies, around 20 each year, uh, our mission. So it's a lot. And um, I, find, I find that the documents um, upon which the analysis are conducted for UPR uh, reviews are wonderful. And they are wonderful sources of information, not only to conduct uh, foreign policy, but also for the other, for the other bodies. There is no other uh, document where you can see a compilation of recommendations or information that uh, is compiled throughout the system. So you have in one document, uh, recommendations for each country that somewhat gather the most relevant um, uh, recommendations from the different treaty bodies. And I, th I find uh, um, an absolute wonderful uh, mechanism that we, what w one would hope, that would be used by the other mechanisms, the COIs and also the Human Rights Council overall when preparing resolutions. Uh, but of course, there is the, uh, the document prepared by the government, which is also interesting. And there is also the document prepared, I mean, the shadow report or the interested party reports that gather information from civil society and um, national human rights institutions. So that is a very, very interesting source of information that I would try to, uh, that I would hope that is being used. So I would, rather than answering, I would pose a question to the treaty body uh, members and the um, special mechanisms of the council to see to what extent they find this information or this uh, compilation of information useful. Second, the recommendations that are being given by the states, in the UPR reviews, are quite interesting. I don't know, I mean, I have been doing UPRs for about four years. And because of my, the experience of our own uh, UPR is you know, two weeks old. So we found that the countries do read the reports, do read the documents, and we have found that the recommendations, for instance, in our case, we received 100, 212 recommendations from 81, uh, 85 delegations. They are pretty specific, policy-oriented, and uh, I would say 98% are non-political, or non-politicized, sorry, not political, not politicized. There are a couple of countries that have a kind of a reverse uh, projection, and they make recommendations on issues that we know they have problems with, which I we found a, a very interesting also trait. But this is a couple only. Um, and I would say those could be interesting also um, sources of information for the treaty bodies. Um, in looking to complement each other, not only the recommendations of the treaty bodies, but also the recommendations of the, of the UPR. Let me cite another example uh, between the universal and the regional complementarity and con connectivity. You know, in the last, uh, in 2018 and 2019, there, has been two, there have been two cases of countries of the Americas being brought to the Human Rights Council and, and resolutions being adopted in the cases of Venezuela and of Nicaragua. And uh, the last one being the resolution that was adopted by the Council on the, on the situation of human rights in Nicaragua. 
And there was something that really was very interesting to me to see how the, and I had never seen this before, how the inter-American system interacted in the process leading to the adoption of the resolution, in the process of um, negotiating the resolution. There were different side events and briefings in which uh, members or different parts of the inter-American system briefed the universal community on their findings. And there was even a briefing by the Inter-American Commission. Uh, we had a, one com a commissioner and the secretariat of the, of the commission interacting with the office of the high commission, especially with the deputy high commissioner on the situation, specifically the situation of Nicaragua. And I wondered when I was sitting there if uh, that were not, uh, that would not be interesting uh, examples to follow, for instance, in in, um, in cases of um, African countries that are being discussed at the Council. To see such an interaction between the African institutions, there are, um, um, you know, as, as a, of course, as valid and as strong, and the universal. I found those to be very um, interesting. Um, finally, I would like to ask a question as well, because we, when we are working at the universal, um, level, we sense, we have a sense that there is some, uh, Dr. Boyle mentioned arrogance, but uh, maybe we can mention some disregard of the regional mechanisms towards the universal mechanisms, because the regional mechanisms have more muscle and teeth, and they have, uh, you know, judicial, uh, access to judicial uh, processes that, and they tend to, re to disregard the universal mechanism as being mainly political. Uh, we have found that in several um, comments that I have heard. So I don't know if that is the so case. Just to, just to clarify that, uh, when you refer to arrogance towards uh, the universal mechanisms, are you referring to disregard of actions of the Human Rights Council, disregard of actions of special rapporteurs, disregard of the role of treaty bodies in country examinations, or the role of treaty body in individual communications, all of the above? <laughs> we have, a, sometimes we get the impression that when regional mechanisms of different uh, level um, quasi-judiciary or judiciary are solving the cases, they might not look into the universal, I mean, to the inputs of the universal system as much as would be desirable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think certainly, and, I, and others may also want to comment on this, but certainly, for example, if a country in a region uh, that has a strong regional human rights system um, is viewed as particularly problematic from a human rights perspective. Um, I could imagine the regional system perhaps not giving adequate weight to actions of the Human Rights Council, for example, with respect to that country. It works both directions, though, because often the response that you get when you try to raise a country like Venezuela, for example, in the context of a Human Rights Council, the response is, well, actually, that's the region's problem. Uh, that should be addressed at, at the regional level. But Andrew, there were several things in there that, that might uh, have been pitched in part in your direction, including uh, pot potential possible roles for African mechanisms um, in, in your area of work. So. Yes, I Would mean, you like to respond? well, from time to time, um, I think it's probably the same for other commissions. We have a choice whether to use the UN universal framework, as it's being referred to, or to use an African framework. So uh, we're particularly tasked to looking at questions of sexual violence. Um, South Sudan is a party to the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women Convention, but it's also a party to an African Union treaty um, on violence against women. 
So we have a choice at some point, because you could talk about everything and then you never really get your message across, or you could focus on, for example, the African norm, which in some ways is better understood, and maybe the African supervision is somehow closer to the government and they are more interested. It's got more normative tug, if you like, than the universal, which is far away in Geneva at one level. So there are real choices to be made there. And of course, at one level, you could be accused of undermining the universal. But at another level, you're just being more effective and maybe choosing something which has more sustainable future um, in terms of building the relationship. So those questions um, do arise, I think. And I don't think it's all about just let's put everybody together and have a joint seminar and coordinate. I think sometimes you just have to choose. And um, anybody who goes through our reports will see that we actually use the African Charter on Human and People's Rights as the main normative framework. And if the UN treaty bodies are thinking, well, why aren't they talking about us, then they can come and see us. But it's, it's, a, it's a decision. It's a specific decision. Um, on the other hand, of course, there may be more options for complaints to the UN treaty bodies, and we have to, in running seminars in country, explain how to bring a complaint to CEDAW, whereas it's not possible necessarily to go to the African Court of Human Rights or to, to do something with the African Commission. So these are really complex questions. Just with respect to the, the role of the UPR um, and, and the treaty bodies, I would say that I would agree that the UPR has been a very, very helpful uh, information generating mechanism for the treaty bodies. For one thing, for example, if a treaty body is examining a small country on which there is very little publicly available human rights information, often it will be the reports submitted by civil society in the UPR process that provide the most current and detailed information regarding the human rights situation in the state. And the, and the treaty bodies will certainly look to that as a source, uh, among others. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, recommendations that states have either accepted on the one hand or have noted on the other uh, will be a basis for questioning on occasion uh, in the human rights treaty bodies. Um, and even in the context of follow-up, I was in participating in a follow-up mission uh, to Guatemala, and here I would note the role of the CCPR Center in promoting connectivity uh, between the treaty bodies um, and governments. Um, and one of the issues that the Human Rights Committee ha was looking at for follow-up was the, the decline of uh, the rule of law and judicial independence in Guatemala, and a number of other foreign governments were operating in Guatemala um, that had specifically made recommendations to Guatemala about the same issues in the UPR process, and so they were identifiable as allies in, in the follow-up process uh, to the Human Rights Committee's recommendations. So all of these are, are things that are, are useful. Um, Michael, I heard something of a challenge there the, do the regional courts, like the European Court of Human Rights, think they're better than the rest of these mechanisms? <laughs> well, I, of course they do. <laughs> I mean, Sir Michael Wood would, <coughs> the Sir Michael Wood School of Jurisprudence would be, uh, as Marco has said, uh, if one looks at the question of law, uh, an extremely restricted one. He would say that judgments of the court are binding, but uh, as a, and therefore they give rise to an, ob an obligation under international law, whereas um, views of uh, the Human Rights Committee are not. Um, but, I mean, I don't subscribe. It's true as a matter of, of legal theory, but that is not the question. The question is, uh, what is the relevance uh, of these views, when taken in the la in the large uh, taken in a larger perspective, and to what extent um, should each body have regard to what has been said um, concerning rather similar issues? Um, I I can say generally that the Court of Human Rights has an extremely healthy respect for the principle of dialogue. 
And uh, the question of arrogance doesn't really enter into it. Um, for, for the court, uh, they see some, that it would be a useful activity to uh, interact with the treaty bodies, um, useful from both sides. And <clears throat> I can tell you a small anecdote about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now, since time, since I've retired, is passing so speedily. <laughs> um, with the authority of the court, I wrote to a senior civil servant working in the treaty bodies, suggesting that as an exercise in connectivity, uh, that we should organize an exchange of views um, or a meeting between members of the treaty bodies and members of the court and I realized immediately there was a problem because there were so many treaty bodies. And I suggested, totally naively, to this person that they put together what they considered to be the most relevant mix. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, not, with what I know today about how dysfunctional the treaty bodies are in terms of uh, their cooperation with each other, I, I, I realized that this was totally naive on my part. There was no answer. The mail did not, was not responded to. <laughs> I rang up on several occasions and asked to speak to the person concerned. Not available, never available. I sent a second official letter, absolutely no response. And um, I, I must say, I was quite offended at the idea uh, that a professional institution like the United Nations would not actually respond to an invitation that had been received, received uh, for official contact. And it, it, sh it demonstrated to me that uh, connectivity is a <laughs> sharing of information is one thing, but there are obstacles involved. We resolved it actually rather cleverly. Um, once I found out what the reasons were, <clears throat> I got the court to appoint a member of staff to go down to Geneva and work, work in the Human Rights Committee for, uh, I work with the treaty bodies for six months or something like that. And through that person, we were able better to understand the, the dynamics of the refusal and the dynamics of the silence and uh, to float the idea that perhaps members of the Human Rights Committee would be interested in coming up to <coughs> Strasbourg for an exchange of views about general comments. And uh, I'm glad to say that that, that that meeting took place. It was the first meeting between the regional and the universal system. And it was about general, the general comment concerning freedom of expression. And it was a huge success. Um, there have been other uh, meetings that have taken place. But let's be realistic. Um, it's essential that these meetings take place from the standpoint of both institutions, absolutely <coughs> essential, that an opportunity is provided to discuss common problems and common concepts. There was a discussion in one of the earlier sessions about reprisals. Reprisals are not only limited to the universal sphere, reprisals are also a reality in Europe. Reprisals against NGOs have brought cases, or against lawyers have brought cases. Now, the court's attitude to reprisals is refreshingly different from that of the universal. And the, you know, members of the treaty bodies, I'm sure, would be very interested to learn about the steps that are taken by the court when confronted with that sort of negative behavior that is incorporated into the case before it, and it becomes an extra issue to be decided whether the state involved has obstructed the work of the court in, in its examination. But I mean, that's typical of the commonality of issues that uh, would benefit a treaty body. Other issues relate, for example, to the court's IT system, which is extraordinary, an extraordinary IT system, and has been recognized as such by different bodies. Um, the treaty bodies desperately need an IT system. It's not a hugely controversial matter. It just requires somebody to take control of the project and get some money from some private foundation. There are many of them, I'm sure, will be willing to do that. And a treaty body system where you're able to access the relevant case law without turning, tearing your hair out for days and using your contacts to find out 
what's actually been decided. This is elementary. In today's age, it is a shame. It should not be acceptable that in a universal and an important agency like the United Nations, that you don't have tools that everybody else is enjoying. <laughs> and the Geneva Academy is working on this issue also, I would say. Madam Ambassador, you have the right to apply. Oh, no, just I just wanted to make a yes. comment on the on this op more operational dimension of the connectivity, which is IT. And um, I don't know if we have a, a an integrated information system for each country in which you can combine treaty body, UPR, and also other sources of information. I do recall the, I mean, the UPR uh, is, uh, information is perfectly uh, systematized, but I don't recall having seen Costa Rica country um, profile with everything in it. No such thing. Okay, and uh, then I don't know if there is, because I have looked at the, um, for each treaty body, uh, the section on general comments, which you, you have to know what you're looking for mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to, to find it. So, of course, we need something that, I mean, the rest of the world is enjoying, which is a more uh, user-friendly uh, system. Um, is there a combined or integrated uh, link to look at all the, rec I mean, the, the um, recommendations and uh, general comments from treaty bodies? Or jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. Jurisprudence. Jurisprudence, right. no integrated, right? Right. The Office of the High Commissioner has a home page for each UN member state, which will, I think, quite accurately list uh, recent reviews by treaty bodies and concluding observations and have links to uh, work of special rapporteurs that are country-specific, among other things. Uh, but they do not incorporate the jurisprudence of the treaty bodies. Um, and in that regard, yes, it is completely true that you have to know what you're looking for, and even then you may not be able to find it. <laughs> um, uh, just before I go to Alexandra, on the issue of the relationship with the regional human rights systems, I'm glad you raised, Michael, the issue of meetings. The Human Rights Committee, uh, in the time that I was there, had a face-to-face -face meeting with members of the European Court of Human Rights to discuss both procedures and jurisprudence, had the first ever face-to-face -face meeting with the um, Inter-American Court of Human <coughs> Rights, uh, with the members of the Human Rights Committee self-funding their travel, uh, by the way, to Costa Rica in order to uh, participate in that conversation. We established focal points for our committee with both the European Court of Human Rights um, and the Inter-American Court. I don't know if we have a focal point if the committee has established a focal point for the African system, because this was a new development that we were working on um, as I was departing. But I will say that, for example, when the committee, particularly when the committee was reviewing countries from the Americas, having a contact in the Inter-American Commission and the court to apprise the committee of uh, the work of that system with respect to that particular country was very, very helpful. Um, and there have been a number of concluding uh, observations by the Human Rights Committee to various countries recommending implementation of judgments of the Inter-American Court or compliance with recommendations of the Inter-American Commission as a result of this relationship. The difficulty is replicating this by 10, right, because if the European Court of Human Rights is, not, is going to meet with the members of every treaty body equally, that's one meeting per treaty body, but that's 10 meetings for the European Court of Human Rights, which may be somewhat exhausting. So Michael's idea, Michael's idea of having some representative accumulation of uh, members of different treaty bodies was an excellent one, and one area where such a conversation probably should be held is in the, in the immigration, deportation, removal, non refoulement context, because mm -hmm. this is an issue that almost all of the treaty bodies are confronting, as well as the European Court of Human Rights, in parallel, uh, without enough 
uh, conversation among them. And so with apologies, I'll turn back to you. You said had, you had more to say, um, and you may also want to react to um, Ambassador White's questions or otherwise. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, when I was yeah thinking about the um, difference between the regional and universal system that um, exists and the uh, possible um, d disregard of the universal human rights system comparing to regional human rights system. Um, uh, so one thing was coming across my mind, um, coming back to history, if, for instance, we open uh, the text of the European Convention of Human Rights, the preamble, and then we see that there is a mentioning about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so that states who sign this treaty take note of the uh, content of this declaration. And then there is a provision, um, the last one maybe, uh, in the preamble uh, saying that the uh, states uh, will be ready to undertake steps to enforce uh, rights set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this is a kind of interesting situation that we have. Um, should we look at it when we see, when we look at the question of connectivity between regional and universal human rights uh, systems? To what extent regional human rights system uh, mechanisms um, exist in there take account of the universal declaration and the norms that were developed, uh, that were adopted in the for the development of the ideas of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These are, the, of course, the 10 point uh, international human rights treaties, yeah? Um, so, but mm, maybe this is more like a um, question in this regard, yeah? So w what could we do with it? Uh, should we forget it or should we maybe look back at the history and what was happening when the text was negotiating, what kind of ideas um, were erased at that time? And, um, with regard to um, states' um, reaction to jurisprudence of treaty bodies and the jurisprudence of the regional human rights bodies, um, there is such a moment um, when uh, we know that uh, treaty bodies uh, adopt general comments and uh, uh, interpret the uh, content of the obligations of uh, states uh, under the treaties. And for instance, the uh, Human Rights Committee uh, was um, uh, developing a position that the views of the committee uh, adopted after the consideration of the communications um, uh, should be regarding, uh, regarded by states as having a uh, legal significance and uh, uh, that certain similarities do exist with this respect between the Human Rights Committee and the judicial bodies at international level, if I'm cor correct um, in that sense. And um, uh, But we also know that the treaties are quite silent on the legal nature of the recommendations by treaty bodies and on the real obligations of states to uh, follow the, rec the recommendations, the legal positions of the treaty bodies. In that sense, maybe states could be really quite careful with this kind of positions, which could in some sense be a kind of factor or an obstacle to follow the interpretations of, of the treaty bodies. The other uh, aspect is that, unlike in the regional human rights courts, in treaty bodies we have members independent experts um, elected uh, nominated by the member states of the treaties, while not all the member states to the treaties do accept the individual communications procedure. And then there is an issue of legitimacy uh, we have. So why should a state uh, follow the decision which was uh, rendered by a composition of experts with an, with a uh, rep um, being nominated by the um, states who, uh, who 
by all the states, but not the states who solely uh, accepted this kind of uh, mandate by the treaty body? Well, I think the short answer to that is that the states accepted the jurisdiction over individual communications knowing the composition of the of the treaty body uh, because that was established by the relevant treaty. But yes, there is a disconnect uh, between the, the functions of country examinations which apply to all states and um, individual communications. I want to save um, some time for questions. So, um, Ambassador White, did you have uh, further thoughts you wanted to offer at this point or <laughs> should we go to questions? Just very briefly, um, talking about the, the connectivity, coherence, and coherence of the of the universal. I mean, at, at least of the universal system. Um, a very important task is to make the treaty bodies become a coherent system and to work as a system and function as a system. I think in that in that uh, process there is also an, an interesting issue to address, which is the perception uh, by each treaty body expert of their of their independence, because the independence is of course in relationship to the country that nominated them or the countries overall, but it is our sense that it should not be an ex a, a thought of or perceived as an extreme independence from the system itself. Mm. And I think at some point it might be that perception of independence might, might uh, somewhat curtail the process of uh, making the 10 uh, treaty bodies and their committees work and function as a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Independence from each other, among other things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Independence from each other, but also independence from yes, but the, the committees, but the 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 uh, members vis-a-vis uh, -vis their not only their peers, but also their the the chair that they domin nominate, but also the process of articulating them mm -hmm. in uh, which, which has a cornerstone in, in the the meetings of the mm -hmm. chairs mm -hmm. of the treaty bodies. And so that that is a very important aspect that we need to look at. I mean, one very interesting question would be whether there should be some overarching governance structure for the treaty bodies. Currently, different treaty bodies have different uh, procedures for selecting chairs, um, some of which may be selected on the basis of automatic rotation, um, which, which makes it more difficult to give the chair authority to speak in a way that is binding of uh, treaty body members, and so the the meeting of chairpersons to date uh, can be very effective in identifying um, common problems and proposing potential solutions, but that doesn't mean that the 172 members of the treaty bodies will follow, um, you know, as they say, you, you can't herd cats, right? But you can move their food. So the question is, how do we figure out how to move the food of the treaty body members? OK, we have a few minutes uh, left for questions. And I would like to open it to the audience. Yes. Um, th thank you so much. I wanted to uh, ask um, uh, professors uh, Klapham and Sassoli and also uh, the panel about their, your views on the principle of the lex favorabilis, on the, the, the rule of the, of the norm the most favorable to the right holder as a mechanism in order to harmonize uh, case law, um, not only um, because this has been discussed, uh, bet the, the relationship between IHL and human rights, but it is at the end of the day a human rights uh, principle. So to what extent, I was thinking on the, on the, on the veil, uh, for example, uh, case law, um, according to the Lex Favorabilis approach, that would be the human rights uh, council view that would prevail um, even within the European fora, if we were to adopt such an approach. In the Human Rights Committee? View, approach. yeah. 
uh, observation, uh, regardless on the debate on whether uh, European courts' uh, decisions are more binding than Human Rights Committee view here, if we sort of adopt this uh, lex favorabilis as um, as a guiding principle to interpret such um, to interpret such conflicts, and to what extent this could be possible between. Uh, between um, universal and regional mechanism, and even between me regional mechanisms uh, um, among each other. Um, my, my second point, coming from um, a, a lawyer who's representing victims in different um, international, regional, uh, and domestic, uh, domestic mechanisms here, I think it is also a responsibility of the lawyer representing the victim to um, to put in the submission references to relevant jurisprudence, because we've been talking here about discussions among the different uh, treaty bodies or mechanisms, but there is also a responsibility and more training to do among lawyers about the relevance of international, regional, and customary norms in general to, to put in the submission in order to make a case. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Let's take a couple of more interventions before we go back to the panel, if there are. Yes. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. I, I just wanted to get back to the topic of the panel in terms of, um, I mean, shouldn't the criteria be what is practical? I mean, we can have a group of lawyers sitting in Geneva or somewhere and saying, well, you know, human rights mechanisms <coughs> cannot make law. Uh, but the reality is that they do, right? And, and the reality is that national courts around the world are using the soft law that's generated from the Human Rights Council mechanisms and you know, even the Treaty Body General comments, and they're not making a distinction between the hard law and the soft law. If it helps them to reach a decision, they're using that, right? And I can cite many examples where those laws have led to national laws, they've led to national policies, so if, it, if it's human rights we're discussing, the criteria should be what is effective. It's not a question of some lawyer sitting and saying, well, I don't think this is law. I mean, that's absurd, you know? So, so I, I just think that we need to think of the practical nature and look at the practice. Look at the practice at the national level. What is the credence or what is the value given to law that's generated at the international level? And I think Andrew was also making that point that for, for the case commission, the African charter was more important. So that's the practical aspect. You know, We don't have to get into a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. theoretical. Thank you. Others? Yes. Uh, right. I, I'd like to get back to uh, the issue oh, of Virginia, the case. Yes, sorry. Sarah, please, for two minutes. Yes. I, 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 this uh, uh, misperception, I think, that Ambassador White referred to of the total independence of, mm. the, of the members. I mean, you would not, you, I think that's, that's something that is slowly perhaps being questioned, uh, more slowly than we would have expected, but it is being questioned. But I, I think there is a danger here in, in demoting the chairperson's meeting capacity mm -hmm. because the, the, the criteria to select the chairs are not the right criteria. I think we're adding two wrongs and it won't make it right. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that I don't think we should look to create another governance structure, which will be another layer of decision making, but I think we should try and look at what is wrong with the selection criteria in terms of selecting the chairs, mm -hmm. but then give the chairs the capacity mm -hmm. to decide, provided mm -hmm. of course they consult with the treaty bodies, they cannot go. But I would say that, I would think that if you select someone as a chair, the person would have the good sense to understand where, till where he or she could go in terms of decision making. I mean, we are all at a certain stage of our personal and professional life and I don't think we'd be making gross blunders in terms of getting into decision make, making that is not for us to make. So I think that as long as we do not look at the chairperson's meeting as the right governance structure mm -hmm. to be able to make decisions in terms of what 6 a to 6 8 has given you, which is the procedural questions, the harmonization of working methods. I'm not going any further. Mm -hmm. I think that has to be looked at, like Milun was saying, from a practical point of view, 
instead of looking to create at the side something else which will not work better if the, if the requirements are still not right. So that is something I think that requires further thinking before we do before we go into the review process as such. So just to respond to that, since I'm, I'm the one that, that engaged on that, by saying that we needed a government or needed to think about a governance structure, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that it be different, that it be external from the chairperson's meeting, but I think the chairperson's meeting as currently configured does not and cannot serve that function. Um, I mean, we need at a minimum to have a process by which the chairs uh, take to the treaty body members in advance of the chairperson's meeting um, and hold a discussion with them and get authority to, to make decisions or some other way to, to secure decisions. Um, so we have questions about uh, victim-centered approaches to uh, jurisprudence, lawmaking, um, and others. Uh, reactions from the panel, Andrew? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, to be brief, I don't think you can get out of this by saying you take the most favorable approach to the victim. In many of the cases, um, there will be multiple people who are claiming their rights. So the, if you just take an obvious uh, human rights dilemma, a newspaper wants to distribute a story about a politician which is unfavorable to the politician and the newspaper say they have the right to freedom of expression and to pass on information and the politician says they have the right to privacy and not to be defamed, which one is the more favorable? I mean, that, that's a question which can't be resolved by saying we just take the most favorable. And it's quite possible that the European Court of Human Rights will come to one decision and the Human Rights Committee will come to another. I don't have a problem with that in the sense that the Human Rights Committee has to take into account a wider range of states and their points of view because you're going to be talking about what is acceptable to that group of states' parties as to what the treaty means. And the Strasbourg system may have a greater interaction with the Supreme Courts and a better feeling for that regional approach to that topic and can come to a different situation. So my short answer would be, be no to that. On the question um, as to is this law or not, I, I totally agree with Maloon that um, it, it's too quick to say that none of this is law, so it's all irrelevant. In my own work as a practicing lawyer, if you go before a court and you cite a general comment of the Human Rights Committee or even principles created by a special mechanism such as the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, as long as it's got a UN stamp on it and it wasn't voted against by the state in which you are, they're going to take it as authority. Now, we can argue about how authoritative and how much pull it has, but um, absolutely I agree with uh, Maloon that it's influential. And while I have the mic, um, I will just maybe make again a bit of a pitch for commissions of inquiry who get a bit left out on this discussion. Um, I think if you were to look at who was making the most law in recent decades, one would probably conclude scientifically that it was the ad hoc tribunals on Yugoslavia and Rwanda. They were determining what is torture, what is arbitrary detention, all these questions which Nobody was really watching at the time, but, but they created a lot of law. They were lawmakers, and they don't exist anymore. And the International Criminal Court, which has its own problems, is also working with a statute, so there's much less room for it to work out. A very detailed statute with elements of crimes, and it's much more carefully controlled. You don't have the, the Pocas or the Ted Merons sort of writing these long jurisprudential pieces which set out new normative frameworks. Have a look at what some of the commissions of inquiry are doing. I think they're the new lawmakers. I'm not talking about our commission. Have a look at what happened with Yemen and some rules uh, that were developed there. Have a look at what's been going on in Syria with regards to children in armed conflict as a human rights matter. There's a lot going on, but these are reports which are two, three, four hundred pages sometimes. And I defy anybody in the room to tell me that they've read them all. But that's where the new lawmaking is going on, not only in the general comments and the work of the special rapporteurs, but also in the commissions of inquiry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's time to get another question from the audience. You had a question. Then. And then. Thank you very much. That would fit a bit, I guess. I would uh, allow myself to showcase uh, the everyday's uh, 
uh, site. It's extremely difficult to get a lawyer if your human rights are hurt in Europe. And instances like big companies or politics or something else are involved. It's extremely difficult. Every lawyer is telling you, yes, this is this and this is this, but I can't do this, go there, go there, go there. Um, I think this is uh, really a big problem. And uh, the other side is that people who try to go for their right do not get any uh, support, not from other people or other groups, nor from um, official sites. So it's, it's, it is extremely difficult in Europe. I just can talk for Europe right now. But we have these human rights herds and, and also corrupt structures in Europe every day. And uh, while well, we had in Germany, I'm German, I'm a journalist and scientist from Germany, we had this mayor who went for his human right, saying he was a military mayor, saying, no, I can't do this. It was the uh, uh, Iraq war. Um, nobody did help him. No, none of his colleagues did help him. He was three years in hospital. He was so dismantled that he had to be three years in hospital. And um, so I found out because uh, I was uh, dismantled a lot. I just wrote about uh, disrespect in case of real estate, uh, nothing else. And nobody else did ever write about and uh, architecture office behind was 60 years ago one of Hitler's famous office. So they had a disrespect uh, Urheberrechts uh, problem. And uh, I, I was told as expert to write about it and I told my boss, okay, you can have none article because I can't write what everybody writes or we do write it. Right. So these are, these are the mechanisms, but then... Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you, I think, because we're running out of time and we've got a couple okay. more questions, but thank you for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel Gore from uh, the Lutheran World Federation. Um, my question is to uh, Professor Andrew um, regarding the transitional justice sort of uh, mechanism in the South Sudan situation. Um, it's, it also relates to what you said earlier about, you know, the Commission of Inquiries being the new lawmakers in the, in the human rights. Um, um, field. So my question is, how do you envision the implementation follow-up of, of, these, of these laws that are coming, you know, that are being created um, in terms of, for example, your own, um, um, you know, data collection and evidence to preserve for, for subsequent prosecution of, of, uh, of uh, potential war criminals in South Sudan? How are you going to do that in the context of a power sharing negotiated settlement where the same actors are actually the ones that are wielding the power in the country? Um, yeah, so any thought on, on how, do you, how do you do that? Thank you, and final question, the gentleman in the back. And then we'll turn to the panel for Thank you very much, remarks. sorry, yes. no, go ahead. for your very interesting and thoughtful remarks. I have just a couple of general questions. Uh, on a piece of, of information that uh, shared by Professor Clapham regarding sharing information between bodies, I would like to know your views about the possibility of sharing information proprio motu, especially in situations where there are systemic human rights violations. Do you think that could be a possibility in terms of best practices? Would that be a good way of sharing information between bodies? And the other has to do with uh, the possibilities of overlap and conflict between bodies. Uh, given the possibility that situations that have been examined by other uh, bodies come up to be before consideration in other bodies, in that situation, what do you think that could be done in order to avoid uh, the possibility of foreign shopping to in, uh, harmonize and enhance interpretations on the same matters? And the other question, what do you think in those cases, it is good to engage or not to engage with the substantive arguments 
dealt by the previous body, especially considering that it could be taken as a way to revisit or review the findings of other bodies, which could be eroding a bit the trust between them. So those are my couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members of the panel, there were a couple for you, Andrew. Maybe on the last question, is it a good idea to have information sharing on atrocity um, information? Again, um, I, maybe it surprise you. It's not uh, always a good idea, um, partly because the information is really collected from people who have had a very traumatic experience. And so once that information is shared, then of course the recipient wants to go and re-interview that person for their own purposes. And then you double the trauma and you introduce the risk of contradiction and so on. So I think it's one of the lessons which uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society and the UN is learning. That sometimes it's, it's better not to, to share and to re-interview and for everybody to descend on the same thing at the same time. And we do need a bit more coordination. You also introduce contradictory testimony, which a defense lawyer will be able to say, you see the witness said this on one day, and then three weeks later she said that, and this other NGO said that they said this. And the whole thing starts to fall apart. So um, I think one has to be extremely careful if one's really interested in, in prosecuting some of these atrocity crimes. It's not just like sharing information about a new law on whether Facebook should be held more accountable or something like that. It's, it's really, really sensitive and the, the risks can be life-saving. Um, as to the way in which to ensure accountability um, in South Sudan, that's a, a long, uh, I mean, that deserves a long answer, but I haven't got time. I will just say one thing. The expression transitional justice implies a sort of brief period when you're gonna kind of do something and then it's all gonna be fixed. But the work of such commissions of inquiry is to collect and preserve evidence, maybe for decades. Um, these are crimes which have no statute of limitations. So it's not about necessarily getting a quick fix during a transitional phase when, as you say, there are still political things to be worked out. But the idea is that there will eventually be some accountability down the line. How do you do that when you can't necessarily do it in, in country? in a sort of lawmaking way to come back to the theme. I'll just finish with this thought. I think if you, if you rephrase some of these crimes so that they can be prosecuted as a human rights crime, for example, under the torture convention, instead of fixating on whether it can be prosecuted in the ICC, if it can be prosecuted under the torture convention, the same act, then it can be prosecuted in one of 160 countries around the world. And so by rethinking your legal approach to the same act, maybe you can ensure some sort of accountability, even if it can't necessarily be done in the immediate future in country. I would just like to jump into this issue of the, of the system-wide coherence, independence, and the role of the chairs of the treaty bodies. It is um, my view that the issue of system-wide coherence is not necessarily a matter to be solved by every single independent uh, expert of the committees. And that there is, a, let us say, a, a, a level of the agenda uh, that uh, pertains to the system-wide coherence that should be uh, left to the treaty bodies. I, as an ambassador, I have to operate on the field, but I don't get to, to uh, set the rules. The rules are set for me somewhere else and they tell me how to write the reports and how to uh, do other things that I, I don't participate in that and I have to understand that. And most of the times I don't like the imposition of uh, methods of work, but I mean it's not my role to decide them. So I think that is something that should be um, further discussed um, for the good, for the sake of the treaty body system. I, th I think the problem probably is less uh, on individual member by individual member as the fact that the, the, tre the individual treaty bodies actually do have treaty-based authority to develop their own procedures. And so you have, by law, 10 different decision-making bodies, and that's the structural challenge of the system. And I, there are ways to overcome it and there are a lot of good ideas out there, but that's fundamentally, I think, the collective action problem of the system. Uh, just a couple of things. There's no lex favorabilis in European human rights law, 
and it wouldn't be <coughs> any assistance to a court that has to decide whether there's been a violation of, of the convention right uh, on the facts of a particular case. On the other side, it's been often frequently argued that there should be uh, a, a principle of indubio pro reo. In other words, where you're having doubts, <laughs> that there's a, a violation that you decide in favor of the state. I'm glad to say that that approach isn't followed either. <laughs> so there's a certain equality there. Um, on the question that was asked uh, about conflict, um, I, I don't think one should really be, I've tried to say this, but I don't think one should be that upset about a, a, a certain level of conflict or, or overlap. Um, that's bound to happen in the nature of things. It happens in national law. Often, uh, for example, between administrative courts in a large country like Turkey, um, it happens all the time. There are, f there are frequently differences of, of decision. And there they have a, a, a specially, special section of the Supreme Court to, that will, is capable of deciding which version is the right version. Um, should we have some possibility in, in this situation? Should there be some possible recourse to a final court that, that can uh, decide who got it right, the, the really important European Court of Human Rights, or the lesser body that sits down in? And well, I don't think that the answer to that is. In, in Europe. In, in Luxembourg. In, yeah. <laughs> in, in Europe. Um, inevitably, the, the, the conflict <coughs> will come back to the lap of the court. Um, for example, uh, now these days we have advisory opinions. If a Belgian court, when confronted, or a Netherlands court, when confronted with a, a prosecution of a woman who was wearing a burqa in contradiction of national law, uh, and now finds that there's a contradiction between what the court says and what the Human Rights Committee says, it could ask for an advisory opinion from the European Court of Human Rights. Advisory opinions, of course, are not binding, but it would require the Court of Human Rights to uh, take into account the alternative views that have been expressed. And I think that's one of the benefits of an occasional conflict. An opportunity uh, is provided to rethink things. Um, and um, who knows, it might decide that it was right after all, or, or it might not, but the jurisprudence, whatever the decision, will be all the richer for engaging directly with the opposing views. And then lastly, I, I have little to say about, the, about the, the row in the United Nations about choosing chair, chairpersons, but I will say this, um, in the European Court of Human Rights, there was a suggestion at one stage that the president of the court should be by rotation. This is often a, a rather selfish view that's proposed by members who've got certain ambitions that they want to be. And the simple observation is this. That, that was never accepted by the European Court. But the simple observation is this. Not everybody, not every judge is cut out to be the president of an international court. I've witnessed this at close quarters. It, it requires a, a rather special personality. Um, so uh, let me just um, pick up the question uh, briefly about the chairpersons, as I was also dealing with this issue. And um, uh, I had an idea that, well, uh, this kind of forum uh, could search for the possibilities to um, uh, ensure that the composition is more equal in terms of geographical representation, as this is an um, important issue in the composition of each of the treaty bodies. To make it equal, then maybe in this logic we should also follow to the meetings of the chairpersons. Uh, this is a challenge, as the, these are different procedures uh, in the committees on the um, uh, election of the chairpersons and rotation, but maybe um, some kind of steps could be done in that regard to make it more representative. Um, and then uh, in that sense, um, decision-making could also be uh, 
enforced in some way. And speaking about the, well, uh, necessity of um, um, regional mechanisms and universal mechanisms, vice versa, taking account um, of uh, their legal positions. Uh, and also um, looking at the rule of um, admissibility uh, about the non-repetition of the case, if it was considered uh, already. Um, maybe there is also a point to um, look at the question of uh, uh, optimizing the work of this So optimizing the work of this uh, bodies in, uh, uh, in in terms of um, um, uh, um, uh, um, sorry yeah so um, yeah op optimizing the the uh, work of these bodies in terms of using the time they have mo most efficiently not to uh, maybe follow to rep repetitive cases so maybe in that sense more research could be done at academic level and at UN level uh, on this kind of issues, um, taking into account the scarce resources that these bodies have, and also the victim-oriented approach. So why it should a particular body give consideration to the case that already was considered at another level, while the other um, cases are pending for the consideration. Uh, and um, also, as, for instance, we had the Vienna Conference in 1993, which was dealing in some sense with the issues of regional and universal systems um, relationship. Maybe there could be a possibility to have another universal conference where this kind of issues could be uh, raised um, in a more detail. Maybe, yeah, very optimistic, but still, <laughs> thank you. A new project for the Geneva Academy. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as Camellia predicted, we have not solved the problem, I'll do, though I do think we've aired uh, some important aspects of the issues. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the audience uh, for their interventions, um, and please join me uh, in thanking the panelists for their very uh, insightful contributions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks to the panel for this very interesting debate. And I think also the way you set it up in that discussion was really also refreshing and very good for the topic to have this discussion. So thank you very much to the panel here at hand. And thank you to all of you for your interest, for having come to this uh, conference and discussing issues of connectivity. So. I will not be long at all in the closing, but just to say a few words, I'll not repeat all what, what, what has been set up, but I think what I take away also from the conference, I think it was a full and rich day and we were reminded at the beginning of the ages of human rights and find ourselves squarely in the age of connectivity. And I take actually also away that it's our responsibility to build this uh, into the system as we see it today which can be done by small steps such as uh, the clustering of treaty body reviews as was discussed in the first session or in the keynote. The first panel did uh, show what we can learn for also the ongoing reviews of the human rights system, the treaty body review and then following maybe also the human rights council review. As UPR, as we were reminded, was built learning from the treaty body experience, especially um, from the different ways and the challenges that treaty bodies met. Now treaty bodies, in turn, need to learn from uh, how to well, combine benefits of political pressure and learning experience, so learn also from the UPR system. The second panel pointed out the role of human rights bodies as critical corrective measures to the SDGs. And I take away also um, things that I learned, like on the um, <coughs> example by the Danish Institute for Human Rights of an example how a technology can assist in sorting out and learning actually uh, what the different bodies do produce and how that can be linked up. Also, there was a call in that panel, I think, to go beyond connectivity to really versus an integrated system, quite a big challenge, I would say. The third panel recalled reprisals as the biggest threat to the credibility of all the UN human rights bodies, and I think that's also a topic that surfaced throughout the day, really the part of uh, uh, accessibility, uh, engagement, and civic space to engage with all the mechanisms. 
And the fourth panel, well, I cannot say much on that, and it's very fresh, so not to <coughs> take any particular points off out of this, but I think it was really great to see um, how the lawmaking develops, in fact, in the international system and how sometimes the question of hard law and soft law is less important than the question of its use and the development in further bodies, including in national jurisprudence. I think also each panel uh, linked uh, the debate and actors beyond the human rights system, which I think was very interesting in looking at the WTO, the High Level Political Forum for the SDGs, FAO, the ANCAC, the anti-corruption uh, uh, mechanisms, the regional bodies, but also, and I think that was a challenge also, but well done by the panelists, circled always back to the special roles of the Geneva-based human rights uh, mechanisms. So in closing, I want to say that uh, I think uh, we can say uh, confidently that the Geneva Human Rights Platform is up and running, and I would like to invite all of you to make use of it, actually, throughout the year and not only in the annual uh, conference, which we'll definitely have next year, and actually I counted for the next five years. I'll talk to the donors about that, but you set the topics already, including in this la latest panel. Um, so do make use of it, do make use of that platform to engage across human rights actors, but also um, to, other, um, to other mechanisms. Geneva is very rich in the eco uh, space again of, of all the international organizations, so to reach out to those, because very often that's the most important part, not to only preach to the converted, but really also reaching out the human rights discussion into other uh, international bodies. Now, for us, I can say that in 2019, we will focus mostly on the Treaty Body Review 2020, as we have been doing for the last two years, now that this review is coming close, detailing and road testing uh, proposals brought up by the academic platform, such as a follow-up to Treaty Body recommendation and views and how to institutionalize this. The topic for the 2020 conference of the Geneva Human Rights Platform is not yet set, but I thought before of climate and environment, uh, I think of uh, digitalization of human rights, artificial intelligence, and there were strong calls today actually to look at the role of international financial institutions, uh, looking at the human rights compliance mechanisms, whether it's OECD or business and economy more large. So I think that's actually also something that merits definitely another conference. The question of fake NGOs or certification of NGOs, credibility of civil society and accountability of civil society surely is something also to look into. Now, lots of topics and I hope that uh, through the year until we have the next such conference, you all be engaging with the Geneva Human Rights Platform so we can decide what best to tackle next year. And with this, I would like to thank again all of you, thank all you participants, the partner organizations, which I will not read out again, but they were also shown on the screens also. It, we couldn't have done that conference without these partners and the people who work at those organizations and made these panels happen. I'd like to also thank uh, my colleague Stefania and the team at the Academy who just ensured that everything went smoothly from the travel of people to come here to the uh, to the day. Um, so thank you all for that. And with this, I'd like to close this conference and wish you safe travels back home or a nice evening in Geneva. Thank you.